Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, 2020 Collier's Outlook Conference. Uh, as everything with 2020, we're doing it a little bit differently. We're coming to you virtually. Uh, we typically enjoy uh, an event at the Boise Center with several hundred folks in attendance um, this year. Uh, we have the unique opportunity of, of doing it virtual through, through everybody's favorite platform, Zoom. And uh, you know, the, one of the benefits is we've got a lot of registrants today that are here from around the country. So not just local audience, uh, but, but folks all across the country. I wanna start by, uh, I'm just gonna give a little overview of what we'll be doing, introduce a couple folks and, uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into the process. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank our sponsors. We can't do this uh, without our sponsors each year. We are presenting sponsors that have been with us for a few years. Uh, Gibbons Persley Law Firm here in Boise, uh, A10 Capital, Washington Trust Bank, and joining us as a presenting sponsor this, this year, Land Pro Data. So we want to thank each of them for their support and, uh, and generous support in, in helping us put this on. Also, at the end of the, of the session, when we break into our pod sessions, our breakouts, we also have each of the, those sponsors, Gibbons, A10, Washington Trust and Land Pro are, are sponsoring individual pods, but also Serve Pro, Infinity Signs, and Skidmore Incorporated uh, are pod session sponsors. So again, thank you so much to to all of our sponsors. Um, today we are we are going to uh, try and address as best we can where we are in the world of real estate uh, from uh, both in Idaho and a regional and national perspective. Um, we've got two speakers, and uh, the first speaker will be Steve Seward, and I will go into depth about Steve a little bit later. Steve's a National Director of Research for Colliers. And then also, I know a lot of you tuned in expecting to see uh, Senator Cherie Buckner-Webb, and that is not Senator Buckner-Webb on your screen. Uh, unfortunately, due to a personal family emergency late yesterday, uh, uh, Senator Buckner-Webb is not going to be able to join us. So we quickly dove into the Rolodex of Zoom uh, speakers and reached out to Matt Erpelding. Matt is the Vice President of Government and Community uh, Relations with the Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I serve on the board of the chamber. Matt and I have known each other well, and he uh, has also served in the state legislature, worked with Senator Buckner Webb, so he has graciously agreed to step in in her stead. Uh, so we will, we will turn it over. I'll turn it over in a few moments to Steve and then Matt and I will have a discussion. And then after that, you'll each have the opportunity uh, to log into individual pod sessions um, with our various groups, our various specialty groups or regional groups around the state. Um, I know there's links at the bottom of your screen and, and when Matt and I are done, the, the screen will change allowing you also to, to select the the pod session that you want to uh, uh, join. Um, and that'll give you an opportunity to directly interact with some of our specialists and uh, ask questions and, and listen to you know, what's going on in, in their areas of, of expertise. Uh, also new, new this year, and you know, in a year with a pandemic and a lot of strife, uh, we, we felt it's very important. We've added something this year, which is we have partnered with Building Hope Today. Building Hope Today is a foundation, a charitable foundation. Uh, one of our clients uh, uh, runs, and we're very proud to partner with them. Um, and we have a text to give opportunity, which you can do throughout this program. You can do afterwards. The, it, it will be available uh, for a period of time following the, the presentation. Um, for those that aren't aware, October is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And uh, Building Hope Today is a nonprofit group focusing on informing, equipping, and advocating to address this silent, violent epidemic uh, of abuse. And we're very proud of the work they do. Um, so please, and again, I'm not the most techno technologically savvy, but I'm hoping it's on your screen at some point. But if not, you can simply text the word GIVE to the number 208-298. 9996, and it will prompt you and, and instruct you as to how you can uh, make a contribution. We hope folks will reach out today and help them. You can also visit their website at buildinghopetoday.org. So one more time, it's text the word GIVE to 
and www.buildinghopetoday.org. So with that, uh, we're gonna we're gonna proceed forward with the program. Before I turn it over to Steve, I just I, I want to, uh, particularly for those that are outside of the state tuning in, uh, and everybody here, uh, talk a little bit about Idaho. What's been happening in Idaho? Um, you know, it, it's uh, we're we're very fortunate uh, for those of us located here. It's such a great place to be living and working. Uh, for the third straight year, Idaho has been ranked as uh, last year. Uh, was ranked as the fastest growing state in the nation. So uh, 2017, 18, and 19, uh, it has, right now we're enjoying a national, or we're, excuse me, we're enjoying a, a population growth rate of about 2% annually in Idaho. And to give a, a reference point in context, national population growth rate is about 0.05% uh, annually. So Idaho is, is booming, uh, Meridian, a, a Neighboring town to Boise is the third fastest growing city in the United States. Nampa, uh, just a little bit west of, of Meridian, is now the 10th fastest growing city in the United States. Um, and there's a reason people are coming here. It's not just the great outdoors, the, the river, the mountains, uh, the, the terrific uh, people that are here. Uh, right now, Idaho is, uh, is the lowest state in the nation for job loss over the past 12 months. Um, our, our unemployment, we, we suffered like, like a lot of places, uh, with COVID, uh, saw a drop in, in jobs, but at this point, uh, Idaho has recovered about 75% of those jobs. And, and as I said, over the last 12 months has the lowest job loss in the nation. Uh, recently Forbes listed Idaho as number three on the top 10 best states in which to do business. Now, this is the first time Idaho's ranked in the top 10, uh, broken into that group. So obviously, to, to be number three, we've made a very large jump. Part of that is based on Moody's uh, has predicted that Idaho will have, we have about an $85 billion uh, economy, and that should grow at 3.5% uh, annually, average annual growth over the next five years. And that's the, the number one uh, projection in the nation for economic growth. Um, and as we all know, uh, obviously COVID has, has impacted us all across the country. And, uh, one of the things that's been interesting is, is it, it hasn't slowed things down in Idaho. It's actually, in fact, sped things up a bit with all the growth we talked about. A, a recent article came out and, and showed that, uh, um, since the start of COVID and, and, who knows when COVID actually started in the United States, but since March 1, when there was so much focus, uh, uh, there was a recent ranking of the top 10 states for net migration in the country. So where people are moving to versus leaving. And just as a, without pouring in all the details, uh, number 10 through number two, number two was uh, New Mexico, which had a 44% positive net migration rate um, you know, between March 1 and this is through the end of August. Uh, number one, obviously, is Idaho. And while New Mexico had a 44% growth rate uh, or net migration rate, Idaho had a 194% net migration rate. So folks are flocking here uh, from the coast, from all across the country, we're seeing it. Um, our unemployment rate, you know, the national average in Stieg, I don't want to uh, contradict any numbers. We haven't shared all of our numbers with each other, but recent article I read at least talked about the national unemployment rate at nine plus percent and Idaho at about 4.1 or 4.2 percent. So, uh, you know, it's one of the uh, uh, lowest in the nation. So there's a reason people are coming here. Also, uh, you know, the trend with COVID and a lot of folks working from home, a lot of folks are thinking about relocating. And now that they have the opportunity to to work from home. Airbnb released a survey recently that talked about uh, Idaho or Boise, excuse me, is a number one location for people who are considering relocating now that they are able to work from home. Um, Boise is the, the place that everybody's looking to saying, hey, if I can, if I got to be in my house or my apartment, that's where I want to be. And, and so we don't see the, the growth slowing. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we, we, as a community in the Treasure Valley, in the state of Idaho, and across the nation, we need to come together and get through this pandemic. Um, and, and 
and we know that's going to happen at some point here. And we're very, we're very blessed here in Idaho to uh, to have the opportunities that we've got, and we we you know feel that will will only continue. And for those of you around the country that are tuning in and uh, are involved in real estate, uh, our phones are ringing off the hooks for people interested in investing in Idaho, in relocating here from a business standpoint. So please reach out to us. Um, you know. This is a place you want to be talking to your clients about. Idaho is really the place to be. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to move forward. And I want to introduce uh, Stieg Seward. Uh, I'm going to turn over the, the screen here to Stieg shortly. Stieg is a National Director of Research for Colliers. Uh, he is currently located in Colorado and is responsible for uh, you know, ensuring that the 17,000 plus Colliers professionals uh, have the, the most uh, recent and most accurate data in the market. Steve, uh, Steve has 25 plus years in commercial real estate uh, research and analysis. Uh, got his bachelor's degree at, uh, in finance at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, which is where he is, is now, where he'll be joining us from, and uh, completed a leadership development program uh, at Cambridge in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, in our industry, data is gold. Uh, having the data, having the information, the comps, the, the, the uh, info on properties is, is what uh, sets us apart. And at Colliers, we have Steve to thank for, for much of that. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Steve and he's going to uh, provide us a lot of insightful information on the economy nationwide and locally. And uh, we'll have an opportunity for a few questions at the end of Steve's presentation. So Steve. Welcome to uh, Collier's Idaho Outlook 2020. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I'd like to kind of talk about what's happening with the national economy. And then we're also going to discuss what's going on as it relates to office, industrial, the multifamily sector, and then certainly uh, retail, which as everybody knows has been uh, hit kind of quite dramatically. So um, we'll just kind of but you know thinking about the economy it's you know we were we're humming right along right we had 128 months of uh, consecutive growth uh, of GDP growth and then sort of out of nowhere really sort of turned the the uh, entire globe if you will upside down um, and so what's interesting is that what we do as researchers and economists is we oftentimes try to look at what's happening with the current situation and look towards what's happened in the past, right? So we want to look at previous recessions and understand, well, what happened then and how is that going to relate to, to now? But unfortunately, the cause of this particular recession was greatly different than many of the previous recessions, right? The GFC was this financially led uh, recession and this one was more of a well it was it was a medically induced type of recession and so in speaking to an economist Chris Thornburg out of Beacon Economics he suggested to me he said let's you know really the best way to do that and I want to make sure I'm sharing my screen here correctly so anyways what he, what he suggested to do is like don't think of this as a typical re recession think of this as a natural disaster that comes in like a, a hurricane or a tornado or something like that. It comes in it devastates the area and then you go and you begin to rebuild. So there's not this financial infrastructure that has to sort of be rebuilt and things like that. It's just really a matter of getting everybody uh, <clears throat> up and going. So if we take a higher level view of, of what's happening globally. We can see up here that Norway and Sweden were impacted significantly less than these countries, you know, Italy, UK, and Spain, all of those countries you would see on TV with the ventilator issues and things like that. But what's interesting is, is the GDP uh, for 2020 is in red. If we look at it in 2021, if we add up the net amount, we can see that Norway and the US come in in first and second place. So that's a good standpoint for coming from. So the impact here in the United States, while it's been painful, it's not nearly as bad as some of these other countries. 
I think by 2022, most of the uh, metro areas should return to their pre-pandemic GDP levels. Uh, however, several of these metro areas are going to get there a little bit quicker. In particular, these tech-led cities, as you can see, you know, Seattle and uh, Atlanta and Charlotte and things like that, they're going to get there in 2021. Uh, we're also projecting that Boise will get there as well. Whereas some of these other metro areas that are either heavy into manufacturing or heavy into uh, tourism, like you know Las Vegas and New Orleans and Honolulu, they're going to continue to struggle. So while GDP growth is going to come back quickly, we're actually thinking that um, it's going to take a lot longer for employment growth to return. And by 2024, I'm projecting that about half of the metro areas still are not going to be back to their pre-pandemic levels. Oops, I went the wrong way. So looking at the unemployment rate, as Jim mentioned, you guys have done a fabulous job in Idaho of sort of returning back to what I would almost call a normal state. You went from a record low of 2.5% up to 11.8%. And then the latest figures I saw is you bounced back down to 4.1%. Um, and unfortunately, the United States as a nation really hasn't done as good of a job. We bounced up to about 14.7%. We've recovered about half of those jobs, right? So now we're down to about 7.9%. But what's interesting is you're, we're now about seven or eight months into this. To me, we're still at a frustratingly high level of unemployment. Um, and you can see this red line. What this red line represents is the peak of the seven previous recessions of those uh, sort of peak uh, unemployment numbers. And we're, so, we're right about there. And so... The question, though, is what you may have heard is, is that 7.9% even correct, right? So if you buy into the definition that a person who is looking for a job that pays a living wage but can't find one is unemployed, if you accept that definition as being unemployment, then many economists are actually projecting the unemployment rate is closer to about 23.5%. Um, and if you look at what it looks like for Blacks, that number is actually even closer to about 30%. So it's, it's definitely a, a tale of two things. What this slide is looking at is the recovery period in terms of how long did it take in previous recessions for us to return back to pre-pandemic levels. And so you can see that uh, we're over here, this blue chart. And... Uh, the red line there represents what happened in the GFC. So you can see that it took almost 72 months for us to return to our pre-employment levels. That next longest one, that yellow dotted line, happens to be um, during the 9-11 uh, crisis as well. So in this chart, what I've done is I've, I've gone ahead and I've plotted employment growth uh, as well as GDP growth. And you can see that in the top right section, these are the areas that are going to show the highest GDP and highest, and highest employment growth over the next five years. And certainly, again, the tech-led cities like San Jose, Austin, Seattle, and San Francisco are doing well. We're also seeing areas that have a higher, uh, a lower cost of living, but have strong job growth like Phoenix, Charlotte, and Denver are also expected to do really well. Sort of on the flip side in the bottom left-hand quadrant, you can see that manufacturing hubs like Pittsburgh and Detroit are expected to kind of continue to, str to struggle because of just the decreased demand both locally and globally. So Boise, uh, I just threw up a little star there. You can see you guys are in a fantastic spot, right? High job growth, high, high employment growth over the next five years. So other than San Jose, or you know, it could be challenged that you guys might even be in a, in a better spot. So what's interesting about this uh, recovery, like most recessions, the recovery is usually led by consumer spending. Uh, but in this particular recovery, this one has been led by the low income earners. And a lot of that has to do with the $1,200 stimulus check that they received. Plus, then many of them also got, you know, there was a $600 unemployment kicker that happened each month, or I'm sorry, each week. And so they were the ones that were really out there spending the money and really pushing along these retail sales. The high income earners, on the other hand, the ones that you would expect should be out there spending the money, 
simply weren't because if you stop and think about what they like to spend their money on, they like to go on trips. They like to go to fancy restaurants. They like to go to concerts and movies and things like that. All of those things were being inhibited by social distancing you know, regulations as well as fear has really kind of made them hold their uh, money tight. And as a result, we sort of saw the national savings rate increase over the last several months. So going forward, I think consumer spending in most metro areas is projected to rebound by the end of 2021. And it's gonna be the smaller cities like Boise that are expected to lead the way. Larger cities on the other hand are gonna kind of continue to be weighed down by those industries that are really tied to consumer services as they're the ones that are still having these social distancing regulations and things like that. So going forward, you know, what, what is the shape of the recovery going to be? Economists really like to try to assign letter values or shapes to what's happening. You know, certainly several people have said it's gonna be a V-shaped recovery, right? Quick down, fast return. Others have said, no, it's gonna be this long protracted sort of U-shape where it's just gonna take a long time. And then many people, and we're starting to, you know, hear more drum beats about this of a, of a W-shaped recovery, which just indicates that there's a, a dip, you get a rebound, and then you slide back down to a double dip type of recession. I, on the other hand, have sort of, even in the very beginning stages, thought this was gonna be more of like a, a Nike swoosh, if you will. So if you think about the early part, it kind of looks V-shaped where we had, you know, the quick, easy wins, but now the longer tail of that as it kind of moves its way up is really gonna kind of take a long time and really the slow grind begins. But many of you have probably heard the media talking about this idea of a K-shaped recovery, right? So what the heck does that mean? So to me, what that means is that there's just this in, inconsistent recovery across different industries as well as you know, individuals themselves. So if you think about it, home improvement stores did absolutely fantastic as everybody ran down and they thought they were gonna go remodel their, their, their bathrooms and things like that. And you compare that to hotels where that's the last place you would want to go or hop on, hop on an airplane. But even within the same industries, you have movie theaters that have been devastated, but streaming services have done really well. Fine dining has been all but non-existent, whereas quick service restaurant and fast food delivery outfits have you know, flourished. Domino's uh, has had record growth, right? So it's, it's impacting industries differently, but it's also impacting individuals differently. And the divide between the haves and the have nots is really starting to become bigger. So what this graph is looking at is this is really looking at the recovery of employment by income levels. And you can see that top line, which is the top wage earners, they really didn't dip down that much. And they've really returned to sort of their baseline numbers. Whereas the lighter blue line at the very bottom is those folks at the bottom end of the wage uh, section there, they have they fell the furthest and they still haven't recovered. And so it's really starting to create this chasm between the haves and the have nots. To illustrate the sort of the divide a little bit more, this is looking at uh, just the percentage share of equities and mutual funds. And so if we look at the top 1%, which is defined as households that earn more than $531,000 a year or individually about $361,000, you can see over the past 20 years that their percentage has actually increased and now they own more than 50% of all that's out there. If we expand that to the top 10%, and so again, top 10% is just, it's $200,000 for a household or $125,000. They now account for about 88% of all of the uh, equities and mutual funds that are out there. Conversely, on the bottom end of that, the bottom 10%, they've actually seen their percentage shrink um, since 2002 when it was at a peak of 21, uh, about 21%, and it's dropped about 10% uh, since then. So I thought that was really interesting. And in particular, during this election year, you've heard a lot about how the Blacks and Hispanics have really begun to uh, you know, flourish and do well. And certainly in looking at their 
their net worth, their growth over the past, uh, you know, four or so years, you can see that that certainly is the case. Whereas whites, their net, net worth only increased by about 3%. You can see that blacks increased by 33% and Hispanics, uh, you know, 65%. So then when you look at that in terms of 2019 numbers, median household net worth. So again, this takes into account, you know, home ownership, what's in your 401k and things like that. For whites, we're averaging about $188,000. But then when you look at what it is for blacks and Hispanics, you can really begin to see the, the disparity between those two numbers. So it's really something to kind of think about. And that really gives evidence to this whole K-shape recovery. It's that it's just not the same for everybody. It's not the same for, it, for all industries and it's not the same for all people. So let's shift gears here real quickly and talk about sort of the real estate sector. And let's talk about office. That seems to be the one that everybody wants to talk about. And it's tough, right? Because everybody wants to know what's gonna happen within the office sector. But, but a lot of this is we, we simply just don't know. There's just a lot of things that are happening. You have this whole social experiment of people working from home that has worked out relatively well. But what I like to think of it is to me, working from home is, is a lot like driving with a spare tire, right? It's gonna get you where you need to go but I don't think you can, you can reliably count on that for the long haul. At some point, we're just social creatures. We want to get back into the offices. That's where our best ideas come into play. That's where, you know, training and, and, and uh, you know, cultural fit really starts to take place. And unfortunately, just the return to the office has been very slow and calculated. So I think a lot of businesses simply haven't even really had time to decide what they want to do with their space, right? Do they need more space to have meet social distancing guidelines? Do they want less space, right? Because they're going to have more people working from home. But if we're looking at this chart, it's for net absorption. And so what net absorption is, it's just the net change in physically occupied space between two periods, right? And so during good times, tenants are out, they're leasing space. And so they're absorbing space. They're taking that space off the market. Conversely, in recessionary times, they're pushing that space back onto the market. And so that's when we have negative absorption. So this past quarter nationally, we had 35 million square feet come back online to the market. When we add that to the second quarter, you can see that we had about 49 million square feet of negative absorption in just two quarters. What's interesting is if you compare that to the total amount experienced over the, you know, the two plus years of the GFC, that was at 92 million. So already in two quarters, we're well over halfway there to reaching those numbers. Not surprisingly, vacancy rates continue to tick up. We increased by about 70 basis points last quarter to 12.6%. Downtown areas are taking the, the brunt of that. They've actually seen their vacancy rates increase by about 90 basis points and are now at 11.8%. Suburban has fared a little bit better. They've seen an increase of 60 basis points and are at 13.4%. But what's interesting to me about this chart is if you look at the tail of the chart over on the right-hand side and then compare that to sort of the direction of the, of the trend line uh, in that blue shaded area, those rates sort of look like they're, they're increasing. The incline is at about the same pace. And so from a comparison, comparative standpoint, during the GFC, we went from a 12.3% to 16%. If we look at construction, this is something that, you know, there's, there's not a lot that we can really do about it. These projects are, are being built. Uh, the interesting thing about this recession is that it, because it came in so quick and so fast, you know, developers didn't really have time to mull whether or not they thought this would be a good idea to build something. It's just it came in and it, it caused its damage. And so you can see that we are running at a very elevated pace from where we were at the, during the last uh, sort of height at 125 million square feet. We're now at 160 million and we're well above that average over the last 20 years. Um, lease rates have been very interesting to watch, right? Everybody expected with the rise in vacancy rates that we would see lease rates start to quickly follow suit and begin to decline. But landlords have been trying as hard as they can to sort of keep their asking rates 
at elevated levels and really not reduce those because by doing so, it begins to sort of devalue the price of their properties. And so what they've been doing in, in return is that they've really started to increase the amount of concessions that they've been offering in the terms of free rent and tenant and improvement allowances. But this quarter, we finally started to see the, uh, the tide turn for class A space in downtown. And we came in with negative 2.9%. Just for per historical perspectives, during the GFC, lease rates declined 25% in downtown and in the suburbs, they were did better at nine and a half percent. I don't think we're gonna get you know, close to those types of levels, but again, it's gonna kind of depend on how long this takes for us to pull out of this and get the pandemic under control. Sublease space is certainly going to weigh into this factor, right? The more sublease that spa space that comes onto the market, the more it's going to compete with that direct space. And when it competes with the direct space, the landlords are gonna to have to uh, lower their rates. So you can see that right now, uh, we've increased our amount of sublease space by about 35% just over the past two quarters. And we've now set an all-time record of 160 million square feet. And it wasn't just one market that got devastated. I mean, it was across the board. You know, you had Manhattan and San Francisco and DC and LA, the big cities, the small cities, they were all putting back space. And why that's important is if you look at how sublease space competes with direct space. Right now in some of these major cities, we went around and surveyed and looked at what at the discount that these, these sublease spaces are being marketed at. And on average, it's about a 23% discount. So that's kind of tells you the, the gauge of where the landlords are gonna to have to begin to kind of compete with. Not surprisingly, uh, investment activity basically fell off the cliff in the second quarter. There was still a lot of, of deals that happened in the first quarter uh, that fell through, but beginning in the second quarter, everything fell off. Uh, third quarter, year over year sales down about 60%. And right now deal velocity really hasn't returned. So um, any type of pricing support or where we think we're at is really largely anecdotal. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, office values decline anywhere in the neighborhood of about 10 to 20 percent, certainly with downtown properties being more impacted than suburban properties. Shifting over to industrial space, um, this has certainly been the one bright spot of all commercial real estate. Uh, however, vacancy rates did increase for about the fifth consecutive quarter to about 5.6 percent. However, most of that had to do with uh, just a wave of new construction that was being uh, delivered, about 240 million square feet. But even with all that new construction, we're only about 62 basis points higher than we were a year ago. Much of the absorption that's been happening um, has been, you know, obviously been fueled by this e-commerce and Amazon has been leading the way. They've certainly been the big story. In the second quarter alone, they had leased more space in 2020 than they did in all of 2018 and 2019. And so certainly they are going gangbusters and we don't see that trend uh, slowing down really anytime soon. Looking at the supply of, of new space coming on, as I mentioned, there was about 240 million square feet already delivered. That's now set a new record. And we've got about 325 million square feet still in that pipeline which for the industrial market is good because they've been very space constrained. And so with as good as that industry has been doing, they're gonna need that to kind of keep uh, vacancies and lease rates sort of in check. In terms of lease rates, we can see from this graph that rates are kind of all over the board. The average warehouse distribution rate is about $6.38 triple net. Uh, but you can see, you know, from here, it, it, it does vary and even the percentage increase from the last recession to now has changed dramatically, right? So you, Chicago has only increased by about four tenths of a percent, whereas LA saw a 27% increase in lease rates. Certainly investment activity uh, in industrial space, they have sort of been uh, more in favor of investors, but over the fat last six or so um, months, there has been uh, just a, a decrease in overall volume that's out there. And a lot of that just really had to do with just the logistics of getting out to properties and being able to tour those spaces. It just was very difficult to do. 
Nevertheless, even though that volume was down, demand still remains very high. Pricing continues to rise. We're seeing cap rates averaging about 6.2%, certainly better for warehouse distribution space than it is for flex space. But, but again, they've dropped by about 10 basis points uh, over the past year. But the thing to keep in mind, or at least keep our eye on, is this amount of distressed properties coming back. Certainly industrial property or the industrial sector is probably the, the most well positioned out of all of them. But that is something to kind of keep our eye on and see how that's going to impact all of the investments going forward. Retail sort of on the other end of the industrial market, right? It's just really been the one, um, the one property type that has been taking the biggest beating from the pandemic. As of the third quarter, another 19 million square feet came back, bringing our year to date total to about 35 million square feet. Still at about a 5% vacancy rate, which really to me seems a little bit low. Um, my guess is that we're still going to kind of see this um, rate continue to go up. But when you compare that to the GFC levels, we're still, you know, about 200 basis points away from sort of the, the peak of that particular time. Nevertheless, we still, um, there's about 53 million square feet that's currently under construction. That's inevitably, you know, combined with the space that's being given back, going to continue to push down on lease rates. Uh, and we'll continue to see concessions, but rates will, you know, certainly continue to drop. The big story early on was this idea of, of retailers not being able to pay their rates. And we can see from this chart that for illustrative purposes, last you know, July in 2019, about 88% of those uh, retailers were paying their rents and were being collected. That number dropped to about 50% in May, but has since nicely rebounded to about 77%. Um, we're seeing that national tenants are doing a little bit better job than non-national tenants in terms of paying their bills. Uh, but the, broad, the, the bright side to this slide is that this trend is increasing and it's going in the right direction. Obviously, e-commerce has been the big story for retail, right? They're, you know, they've gone from you know, about 10.8% up to 16% uh, this year, which is phenomenal growth. But if you stop and sort of pull back and think about this, um, you know, during the height of the pandemic, about 62% of all physical stores were closed, right? So this was about 4.9 billion square feet of floor space that was taken out of action. And with that, think about this. I mean, it only went up to 16%. So that to me really tells you the importance of the brick and mortar stores. Certainly you look at all of the sales trends and they indicate those e-commerce or those companies that have brick and mortar locations as well as an e-commerce platform are doing better, right? So, e so the, the actual hard physical stores are helping to drive e-commerce business. And so for that reason, I think the whole idea of that, you know, brick and mortar stores are gonna go away and it's all gonna be Amazon is, uh, is quite exaggerated. Nevertheless, uh, last year, we saw about 17 retailers go uh, out of business. This year, we're already at 29 bankruptcies. And I saw just this morning, Rubio's uh, restaurant announced that they're filing for Chapter 11. So certainly not a, a good direction. The record is 48. My guess is we're probably going to exceed that. And we're going to see bankruptcies continue well into 2021, uh, just as the retail sector kind of continues to shake out, right? It's certainly been evolving over the past couple of decades, and I think it's just going to continue to evolve. I think retailers are going to be trying to rationalize the number of stores that they have and really, you know, figure out where they should open new stores and cut back on other stores. But I do see the sort of the brick and mortar stores going back to uh, experiences and services once this pandemic lifts. That was the direction that it was heading um, and I, you know, the entertainment aspect and things like that. And I think that's the direction it's going to go back to. But the, some folks at UBS, they indicated that by 2025, they're projecting about another 100,000 uh, brick and mortar stores are going to close. And by that time, uh, online sales are going to increase to about 25%, which might, which might be about accurate. So lastly, let's sort of shift over to the multifamily sector. 
So the biggest question for multifamily is what impact is the pandemic going to have on the multifamily industry, right? Are we in this midst of this great migration and is this the end of the big cities? You know, uh, big cities have certainly been struggling with the, uh, you know, their, the density that they have and their reliance upon mass transit. Um, so we're starting to see evidence that, that there is some migration, right? So this slide just depicts that, you know, here's some of the cities that have been the biggest gainers of uh, net arrivals. And then you can see these bigger cities that have really begun to start to see a lot of these people leaving the area. I think a lot of these people that have decided to leave were probably people that were maybe thinking about leaving anyways. And so I think the pandemic just sort of accelerated all this. I really don't think that this is going to be the, the demise of the big city. I think big cities aren't a lot of fun right now. A lot of the reasons why you go there for dining and theater and all that kind of stuff, you just can't do. So there's not a lot of, of reasons to go downtown and live downtown. And certainly we're starting to see that in the rental rate declines. You can see you know, San Francisco off by about 17%, Seattle's at about 10, so is New York. So it's certainly something to you know, keep our eye on. Looking at overall vacancy rates, class A vacancy rates had steadily been rising before the pandemic. And a lot of that just had to do with the amount of construction that was being uh, delivered to the market. Developers certainly realized there was more money in delivering class A product than there was in class C product. And so that's what they did. And certainly now with the pandemic coming, that's only accelerating the impact on class A markets. Meanwhile, when you look at class B and C properties, they're actually doing really well. There's virtually no new construction for class C property. And we're starting to, you know, really seeing those vacancy rates uh, almost start to decline in that. Same thing with Class A uh, lease rates. We can see that you know they they started to trend up in 18, then into 19, and now they've started to reverse course, which isn't surprising due just to that extra uh, excess supply. Class B has really maintained the same, and then Class C, no surprise, as you enter recessionary times, people are looking to reduce those costs and those you know uh, functional types of spaces are in high demand. So overall, what this has done to uh, the values and cap rates, really uh, not a whole lot, right? We have seen a significant decline in, in sales volume. Certainly in the second quarter, there was about a 67% decline in year over year sales. That number actually improved to about 50% in the third quarter. So we're moving in the right direction. And that's really true for most of the other uh, investment sections as well. There's just a lot of capital on the sideline, but people are, are waiting to get back in. They're just trying to get a little bit more clarity in terms of what's, what's going on. But in terms of cap rates, they really remain basically unchanged. We saw about a 10 point uptick. So cap rates went up for mid-rise properties and they actually went down by about 10 basis points as well for garden level properties. So, you know, where do we go from here? To me, it really is dependent upon how successful we are at mitigating the pandemic, right? And just the timing and success of the vaccines and therapeutics that are coming out there. So the quicker we can get our arms around this thing, the better off we're going to be. The longer this thing kind of continues to drag out, the greater the increase we run of, of flipping from a medically induced recession in terms of flipping into a financially induced one. But I think you're going to see lots of trends sort of shake out of, right, uh, out of this whole thing, right? This idea of this flight to suburbia, I think there is a lot of merit to that. Getting out of bigger cities and moving into, you know, tier two and tier three cities, particularly as people have the ability to work from home. We recently did a survey. It was a global survey, and we found that about 71% of people who never worked uh, from home ever indicated that they would like to begin to work at least one day a week. So I think that trend is probably here to stay. Certainly we're gonna continue to see space coming back on the market in terms of sublease space, as well as just direct space when uh, people come up for rene renegotiations. And then just this bigger impact as it relates to 
you know, the, the idea of deglobalization and how do we become re less reliant upon uh, foreign nations and things like that, all sort of things to kind of keep our eye on. You know, we're, we're still very early in this infancy of the recovery. And so I think it's just going to be very telling to kind of see how we do. But again, the quicker we can kind of get our arms around this pandemic, I think the quicker we can kind of just get back to where we all want to be, like you folks in Idaho. So that's it, Jim. Thank you, Stieg. Uh, a lot of great information there. We really appreciate it. Uh, I had a couple questions come in, and I think we're going to um, allow for those to be answered in individual pod sessions. Most of them are, are Idaho specific questions. I will, I will ask you just quickly, and I, I want to move forward with, uh, with Matt. Um, one of the questions, though, is with all of this stimulus money that has already come through and now talks of, of more stimulus uh, activity, why has inflation held, you know, where it is? And, and is there uh, a real fear of, a, you know, an inflationary spike as a result, you know, in the short term? So that's a that's a, a certainly an interesting question, right? Because historically, when we've infused more more money into the system, we have seen um, inflation start to rise, and we certainly we didn't, we're, we're not seeing that. And so I, I'm I'm not an economist, but I speak to economists, and what they tell me is that they think that sort of two things are happening. One is the the direct relationship between um, you know, in, you know, infusing more money and rises in, in, in inflation, that relationship just isn't as strong as it used to be. If you look back to the GFC, it was the same type of thing where we infused a bunch of capital and inflation didn't, didn't uh, increase as well. So I think that just that, that correlation is sort of starting to diminish as the you know, economy kind of takes on its own shape. But in addition to that, what I'm told is that even though there's been a lot of money injected, most of that money injected has not been used, right? It's still sitting in reserves in the banks. And so it, it's just there as dry powder almost just waiting, you know, through the main street lending programs and things like that for people to come and use that money. And it's just not being used right now. And so that's what's really kind of keeping that uh, inflation level, you know, stuff at bay right now. Sure. Well, thank you. Again, uh, Steve Seward, uh, Director of National uh, Research for Colliers. We really appreciate your time and your input and the valuable information. Uh, I want to uh, remind everybody that this entire uh, uh, conference is being recorded, and we will have all of the information available to share uh, uh, afterwards if you had missed any of it, and particularly have a lot of the slides that have some, some great info. Uh, with that, I want to move forward with uh, Matt Erpelding. Uh, Matt is, as I mentioned, the Vice President of Government and Community Relations at the Boise Chamber of Commerce, uh, was a member of the House of Representatives from 2012 to 2019 in the state of Idaho, served as the House Minority Leader uh, from 2017 through 19. Matt actually was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, and uh, relocated to Idaho to go to Idaho State University in Pocatello in 1993. And I know our team back in uh, at our Pocatello office are all cheering right now, wearing their Idaho State Tigers pins. Uh, so uh, Matt came to the, came to the state to go to Idaho State, and then he left for a short period of time, a period of time, and then returned. Um, one of the many, uh, you know. Uh, a part of our great educated workforce that we're starting to see the trend over the years that uh, a lot of uh, folks come here to go to school and would, would go back to work someplace else. And that's no longer the case. Folks are starting to stay. We've got a great workforce for businesses to tap into. Um, Matt is a uh, co-owner of Idaho Mountain Guides, and uh, he's an adjunct professor at Boise State University at the College of Innovation and Design. Uh, for those of you who were at our Outlook a couple of years ago, Gordon Jones, who runs the College of Innovation and Design, was our speaker in the role that Matt's in today as our local presence. So welcome, Matt. And uh, Matt and I are just going to have a little uh, a chat here, a little dialogue, and get his input and insights on the, the local market and what's happening in Idaho. So Matt, first of all, uh, uh, what brought you here? Why, why did you come to Idaho from, from Colorado in the first place? Well, I, I often will tell people that uh, 
Simplot company brought me to Idaho because when I was growing up in Colorado, um, I often came to Pocatello for an indoor track meet called the Simplot Games, which is the biggest indoor track meet for high schools west of the Mississippi. And for some reason, I just became enamored by Idaho. And it could be that the city of Pocatello reminded me a little bit of Colorado, but um, was smaller and more accessible to get around. But in the end, the decision to move to Idaho was probably the best decision I ever made, although it was to my father's um, initial dismay. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're glad with all, your dad's glad with all the success you've had in Idaho since then that, that you made that choice to come up here. Um, you know, Matt, we, we heard Stieg uh, provide a lot of information about what's happening nationally. Uh, talked about surplus of funds and uh, the PPP funds and different stimulus monies. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, with your history in the legislature, what did, what did Idaho do? What did, what did the state government do here differently that is, has really helped? You know, I, I, I mentioned earlier all the growth we've had even since COVID started. Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the measures that the state took, not only in the, the Idaho rebounds plan, but also the, uh, uh, the, the government money that, that was distributed by the state. Yeah, I mean, Steve kind of said it best. The, the, the um, federal government allocated trillions of dollars for local governments to be able to help their communities. And Idaho is the beneficiary of around 1.25 billion of that. And to Steve's point, there, there's still 913 million of that that was allocated to the state of Idaho that remains unspent. And so what the state did was, um, in addition to having, generally speaking, a uh, conservative outlook toward their own budgets and some decisions to kind of hold back a little bit of money during the 2020 legislative session, but then when it fell into the legislature adjourned for the year and the federal dollars arrived, in the governor's office, the governor set up the Coronavirus Financial Advisory Committee, which was made up of community members, it was made up of legislators from both sides of the aisle, and then it was made up of leaders from within the governor's office. And as a result, he was able to create a very transparent allocation process. He was able to utilize, the, the office was able to utilize the dollars in a way that went to multiple sectors so this includes um, even in some cases, some rental assistance that came from that. There was $318 million that was allocated to small businesses through the Idaho Rebounds Grant Program, which helped small businesses that didn't get the federal stimulus dollars, whether that be the PPP or the um, Small Business Emergency Injury and Disaster Loans. Um, there was money that was allocated to the school system to ensure safe reopenings. Uh, and that is particularly the case in areas where you had less of the pandemic hadn't really reached the community yet. So we're talking about the rural school districts that Idaho has. And Idaho is a unique state in the number of school districts that we have around the state. Um, and then from an infrastructure perspective, they were able to use some of the CARES Act dollars to actually expand, expand broadband into areas of the community by addressing shovel-ready products projects. And that speaks to one of the reasons that in-migration is so important to the state of Idaho, because as we get those uh, broadband projects in, more and more people who are now able to work from home are able to move to a community that's even smaller than the city of Boise or Pocatello or, or Idaho Falls. And then last but not least, uh, he had a, a wage loss assistance program. So what he did was he set up a transparent process, did a great job with that. They really did a good job of looking where the needs were and allocating those resources. And then there's still a large portion of those dollars that have been left unspent and are either held back in reserve if there's a problem. And at the federal level, one of the best thing the feds could do after the election would be to decide whether or not to extend the date for when that money has to be used. Right now, the date is December 30th. But if the feds were to extend that, you'd have resources that the states would have over a longer period of time. Well, that's great. Great information. Uh, I'm going to have another question here in a second, Matt. Steve, if I could, if I could ask you to, to unshare your screen. We've still got the screen share on, I believe, uh, from your screen, if, if it's possible for you to, to click the unshare, Steve. Um, Matt, I... I 
you know, we've talked about the, you know, all of this growth. And I think, you know, with the pandemic, um, the, the, the state has done a terrific job in allocating those funds and making them available to, you know, not only just on the federal level where folks received individual checks, but uh, uh, things like the broadband broadband investment. It's only going to continue to help Idaho going forward. Um, with all of this, this talk about growth, obviously, uh, you know, one of the things that even pre-pandemic that we talked about a lot was responsible growth. And, you know, we, we've now seen the pandemic possibly accelerate the, the process in Idaho. What do you, you know, when we talk about responsible growth, what do you see as some of the key factors that, that you know, we need to embrace um, uh, to, have, to, to ensure responsible growth and also the, some of the inhibitors to growth in the area uh, that need to be addressed? I this, the state of Idaho has an incredibly unique opportunity in the West, relatively speaking, because we've had other states around us that have experienced the same growth trend prior to us getting here. So we have a lot of opportunity to learn the mistakes from other cities. And one of them is, and I'll speak to multiple ones and, and feel free to interrupt me if I, if I get off track here, but one is Idaho um, has an opportunity to create um, an environment that, that is multi-use housing and addresses what has become a problem in other cities, which is affordable housing. Um, the, the idea that we can look at what other cities did right and what other cities did wrong to ensure that our workforce housing and our um, communities have access to places to live in order to be able to work in the communities that they live in is a big one. And that goes without saying, regardless of the city that we live in, whether it be uh, Coeur d'Alene, Boise and the Treasure Valley on the whole, Pocatello as it sees substantial growth from the FBI infrastructure that's going in there and the data center. And then when you look at Twin Falls and Idaho Falls, they have similar issues. And how do we address affordable housing in a way that um, expands our workforce, creates our workforce, uh, creates success for our workforce, and also allows for some discretionary resources for them to be able to just drive that consumer side. The second one is we, especially in the city, in the Treasure Valley, um, our transportation infrastructure continues to be an area that is of relatively big concern because we know, looking at other cities, you could increase the transportation system by 120%, but congestion with this type of population growth will go up 400%. So what are the conversations that we're having on, on a collaborative level with all of the municipal governments about how to create an infrastructure that works for everyone? And that's a big piece. We're starting to see the city of Boise grow into Meridian and Meridian's growing into Nampa. And so at the, at the local government level, really emphasizing collaboration as our, as our visible borders completely disappear. The last one that I'll mention, go ahead, Jim. No, no, please continue. I was going to say the last one that I'll mention is uh, Idaho, and it's not, uh, it's a well-known fact that Idaho is not a uh, extremely diverse state. As a result of that, um, we have an opportunity to really diversify our population and we have an opportunity to grow our population from a diversity perspective in an environment that has more fair housing policies and more fair access to capital policies than some of our older cities, and especially older cities that existed in the 60s and 70s and were really becoming metropolises then didn't have, which created some of the racial strife that exists in some of those cities. We have a unique opportunity now to create actually a more equitable city a city that has a more uh, a real feeling of diversity and inclusion moving forward. And part of that is because of the change in, in federal housing policies and access to capital. Well, I think the, I think your comments about uh, and, and some of the questions that came in you're addressing. And, and again, our, our multifamily team is, is poised and ready to, to pounce here in a minute when we go to the pod sessions, you know, on some of the questions on multifamily, but the affordable housing issue is certainly a big one. And I, I do think we have a, a great opportunity in Idaho, as you, as you talk about with, uh, with our planning and, and how we're going to expand our, our uh, diverse uh, population or, in, or create a more diverse population base here. Um, there's so many questions about, can we, can we keep going with all these apartments? And there's, there's, there's geez, there's apartments coming up everywhere. 
Uh, and yet, as our multifamily group will talk about, we're still behind on the supply, you know, uh, uh, side of that uh, com compared to most places. And then if you start looking at uh, some of the, the uh, you know, demographic trends and the folks that are moving here who are younger, who would rather be in an apartment, be more mobile, be more agile and able to move. Uh, we're only going to see more of that, but it's so important that we, and I'm glad you, you touched on it, it's so important that we uh, uh, we address the affordable housing need within that because, uh, you know, one of the things that rapidly growing areas can, can often suffer from is the growth goes so fast that you price out uh, a very large segment of the population, and that growth slows rapidly. Um, so a question, you know, we often uh, talk about, and, and we have these conferences and different business leadership meetings and, and things where you and I see each other, you know, everybody talks about what, what can we do as business leaders? How, how can we be involved? And I know, you know, your role in the state legislature, you've seen the, the mechanics of that. And, and in Idaho, uh, you talk about transportation, you know, that's a, a legislative action. What, what would your uh, call to action be to business leaders today and where they can focus their efforts, how they can be involved in effectuating some of this change to ensure the, the responsible growth that we need? You know, in my experience in the legislature, the, the biggest challenge that I had was, and this is where businesses could step in, is that traditionally, you know, it's less about partisan warfare and more about an urban rural divide that is fairly substantial. And I think business leaders could help with educating uh, the legislature that the rural communities and the urban communities are actually um, symbiotic in their relationships. And what's good for an urban community may also be good for a rural community. So that's the first thing is, is really addressing this urban rural divide and recognizing that uh, the urbanization of the state of Idaho is not a threat to our rural communities and may in fact really help them grow and expand, whether it be through travel and tourism or other types of uh, development. So that's, that's one. At the local level, at the municipal level, it's really important that business leaders um, develop relationships with our municipal leaders in a way that goes beyond traditional transactional relationships. And what I mean by that is there are so many lessons learned. I mean, you and I were talking about it before we started about some changes that occurred in Denver and Boise has some really similar uh, trends that are occurring right now. And there's a lot of opportunity for lessons learned and engaging our leaders in a way that is uh, genuine, non-transactional, and more about, hey, here's an opportunity for us to create a better modern city moving forward. Um, and the, the business leaders really need to address that because of the amount of knowledge that comes from having worked in different communities and having this international infrastructure that, that folks like you have. Well, I appreciate that. And we, we've, got some, we've got some very energized folks in the business community here in the Treasure Valley and across the state of Idaho. And I think, uh, you know, everybody's excited, everybody's cautious about all the growth. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we're at a time where there's, there's caution, uh, uh, not only on a national, but a local level. I know you were tuned in yesterday, as was I, with the, uh, the governor's latest COVID update. And, uh, you know, we had a very, uh, very, uh, I think the governor did a great job earlier this year setting up the four stages of, re of Idaho rebounds. And uh, yesterday announced that we will be moving back into and staying for, for the Treasure Valley, staying in stage three. So, uh, you know, I think it's important for everybody to remember the, the measures, the masks, the social distancing, uh, the things that we all got to do together uh, to get through this, because uh, it's just, it's really exciting about where we're going uh, in the future, all the talk of growth, all of the economic uh, advantages that we have here in Idaho. So I, uh, you know, I want to close with, A, thanking you, Matt, for your, your insights and the encouragement for, for business leaders and how we can get involved and, and take part in this change. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here uh, this portion of the, the event, the live streaming, and, and get ready to turn it over to the podcasts. I want to just stop quickly and once again thank our sponsors, uh, Gibbons Personally, A10 Capital, Washington Trust Bank, Land Pro Data, Pod sponsors, ServPro, Infinity Signs, and uh, Skidmore Incorporated. 
Uh, thank you all for your, your generous support once again. And a reminder to everybody that our charitable opportunity today, uh, if you want to help out with Building Hope today, you can text the word GIVE to 208-298-9996. Uh, and and uh, give to this tremendous organization. I just did it myself a little while ago and, and tested it to make sure it works. Uh, they'll respond to you pretty quickly. And with that, I want to thank, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Steve Seward and Matt Erpelding for your time today, your input. Um, and I am going to now say thank you to everybody. We will not be reconvening as a group after the pod sessions end, after your individual pod session ends. Uh, that will be the end of our event. Uh, you can switch between pods if, you, if you're paying attention to one and want to tune into another, you can click over to, to another one. And again, everything will be, the individual pod sessions are all recorded. So if you want to talk to the industrial folks, but later find out about multifamily or, or vice versa or any of the other groups, that will be available to you. So with that, uh, uh, as a managing partner at Colliers Idaho, I want to say thanks to everybody for tuning in today. And now your screen is going to change, I hope, and it will uh, it'll take Steve and Matt and I away, and it will allow you the opportunity to log into your your individual pod sessions. Thank you so much, everybody.